Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to continue the series of videos on philosophy of Jason Reza Georgiani. And moving on today to the second lecture over his uh, massive recent text, Prometheism. In this uh, video, we will examine Chapter 2, The End of Humanity. Now, this is in response to a patron's request to have an, an in-depth examination of this text within the school, and therefore this video is for patrons only. I recommend you to check out the first video over Chapter 1 from all the way back in January. Uh, that video link is in the video description. But We'll begin this one by noting that um, Georgiani opens the second chapter by arguing that it is categorically impossible to imagine the coming technological singularity in anything except explicitly transhumanist terms. In other words, there is no way to preserve both traditional human nature and technological progress in the long run. But whereas someone like Ted Kaczynski or Jacques Ellul had indeed reached this same conclusion, but viewed it in purely negative terms as, say, the trajectory leading inevitably to human extinction, Giorgiani encourages his readers to instead consider this notion more positively as the same sort of overcoming which Nietzsche himself had phrased as the literal definition of the overman. That is to say, you can only have the overman if you're going over man to something unquestionably better. In fact, Nietzsche also spoke of a certain singularity in this context, after which human history will have definitively ended and some new higher history will have begun. Why, though, the big emphasis on a clean separation between these two? Well, contrary to the naive view, technological progress is not simply a linear process in which results are concatenated one after another in a fully predictable and consistent manner. The singularity entails results which cannot be extrapolated from the present state of affairs, for they involve the suspension of the very same laws which we would presuppose in doing so. Why, though, did Nietzsche, of all people, seem to view technology in this light? Well, above all, Giorgiani emphasizes Nietzsche's skepticism regarding the Hegelian Marxist view of history through the lens of a dialectical development which, for Marx especially, is filtered only through class divisions. But Giorgiani also emphasizes Nietzsche's revision of the Darwinian view of evolution, instead um, analyzing human nature as a certain transition point between the ape and the Superman, rather than any positive essence in itself, let alone the absolute standpoint of all historical consciousness. Interestingly, Nietzsche's willingness to abandon the traditional reification of human nature also freed him up to realize that the post-human condition would not be democratically identical for all, but would itself involve a split between the Superman on one hand, and on the other, a subhuman race of biochemical robots. As you say, you have the highest of the high and the lowest of the low resulting from this. The human robots themselves will, quite fittingly, ultimately be replaced by literal robots without perhaps losing anything in the process. Whereas the greatest are defined by the highest standard of especially aesthetic beauty, just keep in mind this is Nietzsche we're talking about, the lowest have already devolved into unthinking bundles of sensation who are basically incapable of that sort of aesthetic appreciation, let alone embodying that kind of aesthetic beauty themselves. Even at the present moment, these beings are only concerned with binging on comforts and pleasures which are of a purely materialist variety. It is only too fitting, then, that the etymological origins of the word robot are precisely the Czech word for a slave. Oh, and by the way, contrary to the Kurzweilian stereotype, Giorgiani argues that strong AI is not only not necessary, but is in fact the least viable path for the singularity to arrive, for emphasizing this would neglect the connection between alchemy and the post-human future, which is indeed a forgotten but still very real fact of the history of the movement. In fact, too few people realize the connection among all these themes, and of course Prometheus 
himself in none other than the classic science fiction novel by Shelley Frankenstein. But wait a minute, which Shelley are we talking about? Which Shelley wrote Frankenstein? Well, contrary to expectation, there's very good reason to think that Mr. Shelley rather than Mrs. wrote Frankenstein, specifically because of the biographical fact that it was something of an outcome of somebody's studies in alchemy, but that's really something you can only attribute um, to uh, Mr. Shelley himself. The theme of the story, we might be reminded, is, of course, to recreate man into something which has godlike power. That is something which is often credited as something of the first example of the modern genre of science fiction, but in all actuality, this is just a very old idea which can only really be grasped through its original context in occult alchemy, rather than in any sort of materialistic reductivism. Lest anyone consider this an exaggeration on Giorgiani's part, one should bear in mind all the medieval alchemists who were quite literally burned at the stake for the heresy of trying to artificially create not just, say, biological life, but life with a soul. Well, the whole point of Frankenstein is precisely this latter fact, and that the monster is not just, say, a self-moving machine. He really is something more rather than less than human. At any rate, the scandal of Frankenstein is that archetypally speaking, the story of a creator and a creation made in his own image does indeed contradict millennia worth of repression of this ultimately Promethean archetype in favor of that of Zeus or the Old Testament God who basically, um, according to Giorgiani, um, uh, withholds that right exclusively for himself. This is a trend, though, Giorgiani claims, that we could see even within um, recent science fiction blockbuster films like Alien and Blade Runner in that the real point of those is also the creature which itself becomes a creator. In addition, most people don't know that the singularity really had its origin not in a secular materialist like Ray Kurzweil, but rather with the Russian cosmists who explicitly sorry, saw it in spiritual terms. Interestingly, this influence reached at least as far back as Zarathustra himself as something of an unacknowledged founder of a movement which these same cosmists had studied for inspiration. For instance, whereas traditionally history had been seen before Zarathustra as a cyclical movement of repeating patterns, um, Zarathustra broke with this by instead inventing what John Michael Greer would later call the apocalypse meme. Zarathustra therefore opened the floodgates to view history as a progression leading to a teleological goal, which really cannot be anything except the singularity itself. At that point, human nature will have to be transformed, along with the nature of the whole cosmos, in a sense which might indeed be retroactively labeled transhumanist. Finally, rather than passively accept fate as an inevitable and impersonal thing which man himself is powerless to change, man therefore is opened up to take an active role to creatively accelerate the process leading to this transformation. In modern terms, we could say that man must innovate, and this sort of innovation must occur precisely on technological grounds. Though the idea that technology progresses not by replicating the human person, but rather through moving beyond it might seem blasphemous even to people who consider themselves to be technophiles, this has already been confirmed by none other than the history of robotics research itself, just as Ernst Jünger predicted long ago in his novel Glass Bees that the ideal worker bots of the future would not, not be androids identical to the human worker, but would instead be tiny insect-like machines. Automation has indeed made leaps recently only through observing and copying the behavior of such seemingly lower life forms. Will this, though, bring about an end to all drudgery, such as the three hours per day which were spent by peasant women who had to grind grain to be able to make bread the following day, which was, of course, the norm in Jesus era? Will it free people up to have the leisure to use their creative faculties, or will it only make us all into identical robots who are incapable of creative or free thought?
Well, one thing which we can say about the post-human beings is that in their original conception, they were eerily more like a return to the vastly distant past. Shelley himself allowed his wife to take credit as the author of the text of Frankenstein out of an attempt to have the novel be the product of Shelley as united with his own lost feminine self, a quest which most people don't know had consumed him precisely because he literally interpreted Plato's ancient claim that humans were originally androgynous, that is to say, they were both male and female at once, and they were only later separated into the two classic genders as something of a secondary deviation. The full story is, of course, that Prometheus is associated with uh, this original androgyny. He is, in fact, the only male deity who is associated with the feminine symbol of the moon. And the two genders emerged after Zeus split them up as something of a punishment meant to derail the Promethean trajectory of progress from going forward. Ever notice, for that matter, how the purest expression of archetypes in our era is undoubtedly within the realm of comic books? Yet these are full of such androgynous figures, most notable of all, of course, the Joker within the Batman franchise. Is this only a pagan idea, or does this fall into binary gender have an equivalent within the narrative of the Judeo-Christian tradition as well, perhaps even within scripture? Well, you must keep in mind that in the original Hebrew wording of the text, the book of Genesis, according to Giorgiani, makes it quite clear that Adam and Eve were banished from the Garden of Eden in order to prevent them from eating the fruit from the second forbidden tree, not necessarily only as punishment for eating the fruit from the first. If they actually did eat from the second tree, they would, of course, gain immortality and the gods and yes, by the way, in the original Hebrew, it is in the plural, would no longer have power over those humans' fates, which would now lie within their own hands to control for themselves. Who then tempts them to commit this sin except Prometheus himself, who is, of course, portrayed archetypally in the garden as the serpent? Charges that Prometheism is Luciferian are therefore actually totally correct on an archetypal level. What then can we say of this re-emergence of androgyny not only in the fiction of Shelley but also in the literal sense that to date, no one really knows why there was a surge in documented cases of hermaphrodites in the 19th century. Well, the answer really hinges on alchemy's relation to nature itself. While some have argued that alchemy by default perverts nature, others have argued that it works with nature, while only a daring few have claimed that alchemy overpowers nature. Shelley is unapologetically of the third school of thought, and his Frankenstein must be read accordingly. Similarly, Giorgiani closes the chapter by providing in-depth readings of several films from the Alien and Blade Runner series in order to show that contrary to expectation, going beyond human nature does not mean losing the very possibility of ethics forever, but instead paradoxically portrays beings which are somehow more ethical precisely because they go beyond the petty weaknesses and pathological vices which are, are um, definitive of human nature itself. More Bizarre still is the way that the archetype associated with the less ethical beings in these stories is precisely that of the Old Testament god slash Zeus himself, who Georgiani claims is not all good, but is only ever selectively good. He's only merciful to those who had managed to get on his good side, and is otherwise incredibly sadistic and cruel in his dealings with man, a similar charge made by that of uh, Richard Dawkins himself. In other words, the Prometheus humans of the future are not only more moral than man, by Drojani's own account, they would be more moral than God himself. This only makes sense when you realize that being post-human does not imply losing anything, but rather gaining something. To be more than human is not the same as being inhuman.